Um, so I've got a handout, but I don't have one for you. So um, we're just going to roll through it. It's going to be easy to, to follow along. Um, uh, God gave um, his people Israel. So you guys are very familiar with the Old Testament and with a lot of the stories that we're referring to tonight. God gave his people Israel position, possessions, and privileges. The, th- the same three things that we are studying. God chose Israel for a very specific reason. Um, God actually intended to live among them. He actually intended to walk among them and to tabernacle with them as a dwelling place. He wanted to establish his covenant with them and he wanted to bless them. So if we go back to the early chapters of Genesis, if we go to Genesis chapter 15, we see God's dealing with Abraham. And he, began, he, he, he gave him promises. He made a covenant with him. And um, if we actually skip to, to chapter 17, we see God making his covenant with Abraham in, in verse 2. John, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 2, he says, I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. He tells him in verse 4, thou shalt be a father of many nations. Changes his name. He says in verse 6, I'll make thee fruitful. I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. I established my covenant between me and thee, verse 7, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So he chose Abraham and Abraham's descendants and he gave them a position. He also gave them possessions. We're going to look at that a little bit tonight. And he gave the Israelites special privileges. Um, he, He dwelt with them. Um, but he also gave, as we're learning, he gave the people in this time period position, possessions, and privileges. And while there's a parallel there, there's something I think we can learn about how God deals with his people. But there are distinctions there. There are differences. And I think a lot of times we um, commandeer someone else's position. I think mentally we assume someone else's possessions or we think that's the way things are going to work. Um, And I think a lot of times believers can struggle with that type of thinking. Believers can struggle with the idea that, well, if I'm doing good, then good things should happen to me. Um, That balance sheet should always be going up. Um, You know, I I can um, definitely, um, we are suffering together, Luke, with the idea of your pay scale. We, we are sufferers together in that because I, I can understand the idea of thinking that, that you should be making more than, than what you're being paid. You think you're worth more than that. So we're suffering together in that. But there's no promise in the New Testament for God's people um, today that doing right will bless your bank account. That was a promise that was made for Israel. So um, as... Um, Our church has been learning in our discipleship groups over the past several months. God has given believers position and possessions. And when the study is completed, we'll see privileges as well. God provided what was needed to live in each dispensation and to live in a glorious way. All that was needed for Israel and all that is needed for us today is provided by God. God um, has provided... Um, great things for us to live the Christian life to its fullest, to experience God's grace to its fullest. And we should approach God using the provisions that He has set out for us. If we will simply utilize those provisions, then the believer can enjoy the best life possible. It's that simple. So um, what I hope to do tonight is kind of just do a parallel. We'll take a look at the um, position that God gave to Israel and the position that God gave to us. We'll look at the possessions that he promised to Israel and we'll review the possessions that he's promised to us. And then we'll look at the privileges that he gave to Israel and we'll preview the privileges that we're going to be studying here in the next few lessons as we finish up this study on possessions. But I just want us to understand that In each dispensation, in each time period, God established um, a steward, someone to manage his property, and then he established a rule of life. 
And he said, if you will do this, then you can have this. Otherwise, you get this. And so this is not for salvation. This is not works for salvation. Salvation and joining the kingdom of God has always been by grace, through faith, based upon the cross work of Christ. No one can achieve salvation on their own. But this is how to utilize our present tense salvation. How to utilize um, the here and now that God has for us. And we can see in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28 how easily it's laid out for the nation of Israel. But what we're studying is how it's distinct and how it's different for us today. Too many believers are trying to approach God using provisions that were provided for somebody else in another time period. And so is it any wonder that their expectations are not being met? Is it any wonder that they're confused as to why they don't have power in their Christian life? Too many Christians are expecting things of God that God never promised them. And so it's very important that you understand what you've been given. You understand what you possessed at the moment of your salvation. Because the more you understand that, and I've, I've heard three people, I think, say it today, that I've never heard this before. I've, I've never been shown this before. This is new to me. If you can gain a handle on what you've been given and you understand what God has provided, your faith will be strengthened and you'll say, you'll, you'll be thanking God every day. Say, that's exactly what I needed. That's the measure of grace I needed to get through today. That's the measure of strength that I needed to, to thrive today and to live the fullest, victorious Christian life that I could today. And it's a burden for me to see Christians not using it and, and being confused and being frustrated. In fact, going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction and, and having the confidence um, that comes from uh, being deceived and being misled. So let's take a look real quickly tonight. So let's take a look at this idea of, of being called His people. Let's go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 6. So God actually gave Israel the position of being um, His people. He actually said um, in His dealings here uh, with Moses um, back in the beginning of Exodus, He says in verse 5, I've heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians kept in bondage, and I've remembered my covenant. This covenant that He made with Abraham that we just looked at back in chapter 17. So we're in Exodus chapter 6 now, verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I'm Jehovah. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So he basically told them here, this is going to be your position. You're going to be my people. I'm, I'm, I've sanctified you. I've set you apart. The Egyptians, not the Hittites, not the Philistines, not, not the whoever was around. It was going to be the Israelites. You are going to be my people. So this covenant we see today has actually, it's still enforced, but it's been set aside. The nation of Israel has been set aside, but it will be brought to fulfillment. If you want to... Um, you can go to Joel chapter 2, you can go to Jeremiah 31, you can go to Zechariah 13. You can read those chapters if you want. Zechariah 13, Jeremiah 31, and Joel 2. You'll see that God's not done. Uh, in fact, that Jeremiah passage is a very familiar passage. He said, I'm going to write my law on their hearts. I'm going to make sure that they understand that they are my people and I am their God. He's not done with Israel yet. He's going to, the Zechariah passage actually refers to that I'm going to take one third of them and I'm going to purge them. Two thirds of the nation of Israel is going to be wiped out during the tribulation period. But God will take one third through the fire and every single Jew, every single Israelite that's remaining on the face of the earth at that time will look to the heavens and acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah and they'll all be saved. So it's something that's yet to come. So this position of being God's chosen people actually came with possessions 
and with privileges. So it's very similar to the grace believer today, but there is a very marked contrast. We could take a look at Leviticus 26. In fact, flip there real quick. I just want you to see some things real quick. Leviticus 26. This chapter is divided up in half. The first 13 verses basically are blessings for obedience. This was the, uh, when God established the law with the nation of Israel, this was their rule of life. And he said, if you want to be blessed, here's, here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to approach me. Not for salvation. Again, salvation was not based upon their works. Um, this was for um, dispensation of God's property. This was for his bless, him to bless them. And we see these blessings, they're very physical. Um, we see a recounting of, of their part um, in verses 1, 2, and 3. Um, we see what, what they should do, um, that they are to, um, we see basically the Ten Commandments recounted in the first three verses, but we see what God has promised them in verse 4. He's going to give them rain. The, the land is going to yield their increase. Um, they, their crops are going to make it to the sowing time and the reaping time. You shall eat your bread to the full. Verse 5, you'll dwell in your land safely. I'll give you peace. Um, you'll chase your enemies. Verse 7, they'll fall before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight. And so we basically, you shall eat the old store, verse 10, and bring forth the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you. I will be your God. You shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you to go upright. So the blessings are very tangible. There are things that they're going to be able to see. Well, God gave Israel these physical possessions, and God's covenant is being um, basically carried out here. The covenant that we looked at back in, in chapter 17 of Genesis is being realized. This is specifically how that's being carried out with these thousands and thousands and millions of people that came up out of Egypt. So if we're to flip-flop, we can take a look at the position that you've been given. If you remember back to the first four studies, we, um, the grace believer has been placed not as God's people, um, not as um, we're not a nation. The United States is not like the new Israel. There's a theology out there called replacement theology, and it's not biblical. Israel um, is not being replaced by the people today. But they've been set aside, and the grace believer has been placed in this invisible thing called the body of Christ. We've been crucified with Christ. We've been buried with Christ. We've been risen with Christ. We're ascended with Christ. We are dead to the law. We are dead to works. We're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. These are the things that we looked at when we were beginning our study on position. We've been placed in the body. This position allows the believer to see himself the way the Father sees him in his reflectional thinking. We're seen as holy, complete. We have to our account all the righteous acts of the Son. Every righteous act that the Son committed on earth, the the holy life he lived, God gives you credit for. It's on your resume. The body also receives tangible benefits. Um, These are the things that we'll look at in uh, possessions and privileges. Because we're in Christ, we have stability. Um, We've not been found guilty in God's court, but yet we've been declared righteous. Paul says we're rooted and grounded in Him. Each believer has a place and a function in the body of Christ. We've been given a spiritual gift. There's a myriad of benefits that stem from this mindset that we've looked at over these first four studies. So we compare what God gave to Israel and we see what God has given to us. And you have to be able to understand the difference. Um, It's important when you go through Romans chapter 6, when you see one of the privileges, one of the benefits that you've been given is an ability to overcome your sin nature. 
This is something that we see people all through the Old Testament struggle with. Their sin natures took control and got them into trouble over and over and over again. But you've been given the ability to have victory over your sin nature. This is something that you've been given as a present possession. If you read Romans chapter 6, what are you going to see throughout the first 13 verses? That you're buried with Him. That you are risen with Him to walk in newness of life. That you're crucified with Him. Your position in Christ is what gives you the power to be able to overcome your spiritual enemies. That is a distinction that you have to understand. How does Satan attack us? What are some of the the ways in which we are tempted? What are some of the fiery darts that the evil one throws at us? What kind of spiritual attacks? Discouragement is one. Pride. Anxiety. These are things that, those three things that I just mentioned, do believers struggle with those three things? They do. What's the answer? Positional truth and the ability to see yourself the way the Father sees you is vital to being able to overcome discouragement, doubt, pride, anxiety. These are things that are necessary. They are woven in to the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the benefits of salvation. You have to be able to understand what you have been given in Christ. You take a look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, before we talk about the armor. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Where is your strength found? In the Lord, in your position in Christ. That's where that That's where that power is. If you're not living a victorious Christian life, you don't have a firm grasp on positional truth. You can't do one without the other. It's necessary. So we take a look at the second idea of of possessions. The tangible stuff, we just kind of went through that list. Lands, flocks, herds, dominance over their enemies, access to their enemies' possessions to take plunder. All these things, all these were possessions. Land back then was a really big deal. When you take a look at um, the ability to recover land that was sold or taken away from you every seven years, the year of Jubilee, um, these are things that, that were based upon your heritage, based upon your ability to prove that you were of this particular person in this tribe because of your position, because that was God's chosen people. All those things went together. All those possessions were based upon that. And what have we been learning about? Well, the possessions for the believer under grace. What's the difference? If we were to go back to Leviticus and read the second half of that chapter, chapter 26, what would we find? We would find the curses for disobedience, right? So one of the nice things that the believer doesn't have under grace is the or else. Your forgiveness is not conditional. What do we find in the Gospels? That if you are at the altar seeking atonement and you have aught with the brother, what are you supposed to do? Get up and go take care of it. We have that story told to us of the one who had his forgiveness rescinded because he didn't give forgiveness to others because of their debts, right? Forgiveness under law was conditional, was based upon your willingness to forgive someone else. Forgiveness for the grace believer is unconditional. Now, what do we see in Ephesians 4.32? Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, for God's sake, hath forgiven you. You have forgiveness as a present possession. Go forgive others. Have a forgiving spirit. That was one of those things that is a satanic attack, an unforgiving spirit. So the the possessions for the grace believer are not conditional upon obedience. They were given to the believer on behalf of the obedience of Christ. In order for these possessions to be enjoyed and participated in, however, the believer needs to be yielded to the spirit. We see Paul say, 
you make the cross of Christ to none effect. You nullify the benefits of the cross of Christ when you decide you want to live carnally. But to be spiritual, it just takes a changing of the mind and you can be yielded to the Spirit and you can enjoy the benefits of grace once again. That's how He wants you to approach. We have this idea of shared position with other saints, built together, blended together, bound together, knit together, workers together, slaves together, chosen together, citizens together, sufferers together with other saints. Each of these mindsets provides the believer with things to ease his mind as he lives the Christian life. These possessions provide the believer with what is needed to live the Christian life in a victorious way to the fullest. Jesus said, I came to give you life and I came to give it more abundantly. I came to give it more abundantly. So the believer just needs to approach God using the provisions in order to enjoy the Christian life to the fullest. So let's move quickly. We're only about 10 minutes left here. Paul, what about privileges? What kind of privileges did the Israelites have? Well, Paul asks, if we go to Romans chapter 3, turn over to Romans chapter 3, Paul asks and answer this question, what advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? What benefits did the Israelites have that, that others didn't have? What, what was the, the advantages of being uh, an Israelite? Well, Paul says, much every way, chiefly, because un, that unto them were committed the oracles of God. That was one of the big benefits that the Israelites had. They, got, they were given the word of God, and the prophets came, and they gave those privileges to the nation of Israel. This ranks pretty high among privileges. They were called the people of God. God called them, the, he called himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, pretty powerful. In the Mosaic Law, he set forth many privileges regarding the ownership of land, the benefits of family, and of being in a particular tribe, other entitlements that were given those of Jewish heritage. All of these stemmed back to the covenant that he made with their father, Abraham. They received atonement or forgiveness based upon the quality of their sacrifice, their willingness to forgive others. There were times when God did not reckon sin to their account because there was no law that applied. There's a lot of privileges of being called an Israelite. Their sin was covered until a better sacrifice could be found. We, of course, know that better sacrifice was Christ. And He came and was the perfect sacrifice. But when we see privileges under grace, these a little preview for you. We're going to talk about redemption. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about being blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? We talked a little bit about that tonight. Also, um, one of the privileges we have is we are made near to God. What does that mean? So these are things that we're all going to study a little bit deeper when we get to the privileges portion. So the believer is blessed. God is saying good things about him right now. Again, not because we deserve a pat on the back and we're doing such a great job. Once again, because of the work of another on behalf of the cross work of Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 1, 3, that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Now, Pastor explored the topic of redemption and forgiveness recently in his study in Colossians. He did a pretty good job with that. That was one of those messages where I'm like, there's no way he's going to get that verse done in, in this amount of time. But he nailed it. Got us out of here by 12. We're going to dig into these topics a little bit more in, in this next section of privileges, we're going to look at what it means to be forgiven, what it means to be redeemed. Um, and what the main thing is, is if you understand that, you'll carry that around in your mindset. We see in world system religion, shame and guilt are used to manipulate people into action, into behavior. Um, maybe you've been a part of a world system church or a church where... Um, the leadership tried to use guilt and shame to get you to do something. Well, under grace, all service to God is voluntary. And we can't say that phrase enough. That your service to God is, is voluntary. It should be out of love. Because if you read the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13, if your service is not out of love, does it profit anyone? No, it's like, it's, there's a, I think there's a lot of clanging going on in Christian circles. 
There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of religious activity. But there's not a lot of spiritual service. And so um, my burden for you and my burden for Gulf Coast is that when we serve, we serve with the shared position mindset. That we are um, taking that measure of faith and grace that we've been gifted with and directing that back towards the body. That we have people utilizing their spiritual gifts in a way that will profit the body of Christ. And God will get the greatest amount of glory from that and we will get the greatest amount of benefit. So seeing the parallels to how God dealt with Israel, I think can be of real benefit to the believer. But in order to truly experience the full benefits of what we have in Christ, we must see and understand what is unique about these topics under grace. God wants the believer to use what he's provided to live the fullest Christian life. Too many times, the believer seeks to earn his own way, try to seek the approval of the Father. What that actually does is it nullifies the work of Christ in your present tense salvation. You lose the present tense benefits. You're going to be beaten up by your spiritual enemies when that takes place. You, know, you won't lose the benefit of your um, future tense salvation. That's settled because of the cross work of Christ. But you'll be, you'll be missing out on living the Christian life the way you were intended to. We become open to attack by our spiritual enemies. Our spiritual gifts, as we mentioned, are not being used in a way that profits me or the body. This study is definitely of profit to the believer. It was one of the things that made me excited about Pastor asking us to put this together and to put it before you. So hopefully it's been a blessing to you. Hopefully it's been an encouragement. Any questions, any comments? We want to kind of open it up. This was kind of a survey of the entire study. Kind of step back and try to take a big... Uh, picture approach as what we're doing and why we're doing it. We probably have another, we may finish this study maybe sometime over the summer. Uh, some of us were probably a little further along than others. I think Alan's ready to jump into to number 10, number 9 or number 10. Um, but we've got uh, probably 10, uh, sorry, 12, maybe 13 lessons by the time we're, we'll be done. Anybody have any comments, any questions? Yes, sir. You said that you were given power to serve in the church. I was kind of wondering in plain view, like how much of that passes through the individual, how much that is passed through the power of the power of God to serve in the church. So I would probably say it the way Paul says it in Romans. Um I think believers uh, are suffering under the delusion that I think they're placing themselves under the power of their own sin nature. And um, that is not necessary. So um, I think God placed in you and in every believer His divine nature. And if you will yield to that, that's power over your spiritual enemies, if you'll yield to it. I don't think it's Alex's power or Steve's power. I think it's divine power that's been placed literally inside us. That's how I would describe it. So um, I think to... I think there's a danger in trying to say, I pray and then God's power comes on me. That's kind of Old Testament. That's kind of Samson. That's kind of charismatic. Uh, I don't think that's... I think this has been placed in us at the moment of salvation. Yes. Yes. So, I might say both. I might say it's God's power that's been placed inside us. And I think that is... Um, again, um, I think that's just taking Romans chapter 6. I think that's taking these verses and being very literal with them. Does that, does that help to answer your question? I think it's a great distinction because I do think sometimes believers, once I've been saved, I got this, God. I'm, I'm strong enough to deal with this problem on my own. And I think that's Galatianism. And that, I think the Galatians thought that they could do that. 
and Paul sets them straight in chapter 3 and he says, um, are you foolish to think that you've begun in the spirit, but now you can bring yourself to completion, to perfection in the flesh? And so I think a lot of Christians suffer under that delusion sometimes. It is God's power, and I have to yield to it. It's God doing the work. But it is inside us. Um, I don't have to beg him for it. I just need to appropriate it and direct it. We've been told how to do it, and we've been given the power to do it. It's his power, but, but if we do things the way he said to do it, we can expect it to be there every time. We can have victory every time. Good question. Anybody else? yourself in the picture and say, wow, I really got this because it's really glorious. And do you see, you know what I'm saying? It's a slippery slope. Uh, well, it's a temptation um, to take something that is good, um, spirit-filled service, and to get it to distract you from where you need to be. That's one of Satan's fiery darts. That's that fiery dart of pride. And so the belt of truth Helps you to see things from God's perspective. This is truly for God's glory. We see in a lot of those verses where we're being told about Satan's methods, you see that word humility pops in. Be humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And so that is a protection against that mindset. Because if, if we're going to serve God, then the devil wants you to be distracted by your service. He's going to try to get you coming or he's going to try to get you going. And it is a slippery slope. You're right. Which is why going back to Scripture and having that as our permanent mindset, we need this reminder often. I'm with you on that. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Let's close in prayer. We'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the privilege. Lord, be with those, uh, Dan and Rebecca and the, their kids as they're traveling. I pray that you bring them back to safely Friday. And again, for those on that Puerto Rico trip, uh, bring them back safely. And Brent and Courtney as well. Lord, we're just grateful that we have this place and uh, that it, it can continue while others take nice little trips. And just pray that you be glorified in the meantime. Keep our mind fixed upon you empowered by your power and your might. And we ask on your son's precious name. Amen.